Hi, my name is Stephanie, and I'd like to welcome you all today to our webinar, The Daily Life and Times of an IT Service Owner. A few quick notes, your phone lines are muted today, so please use the chat panel or the questions panel to submit your questions to our speakers. Also, you may find it helpful later in the presentation to take your screen to full screen mode, and you can do this from the toolbar. And this will be helpful, especially when Jeff is doing his demo, so you can see some of the details in our portal. Lastly, this event is being recorded today, so you will receive an email from that same ReadyTalk email address that you received your confirmation. And that email will have a link to the slides and a link to the recording. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Don Kasten, CEO of Evergreen Systems. Don? Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday, and thanks for joining us. I'm Don Kasten, CEO of Evergreen, and with me is Jeff Benedict, who heads up our ITSM practice and leads our innovation efforts. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome. If you're a past attendee, thanks for coming back. Our goal, as always, is to share valuable information and insights you can use in your planning and activities right now. The topic we will explore today is the daily life and times of an IT service owner. After a very little bit about Evergreen, we'll dive into that topic. After, beyond that, we'll briefly demonstrate our view of a very advanced self-service catalog and portal experience, which is built on ServiceNow, and you can submit questions as we go. Evergreen is a U.S.-based consulting firm, and we've worked with hundreds of mid-market and enterprise both organizations, both public and private. Over the past 18 years, we've delivered about 4,000 ITSM projects. We're full life cycle, meaning we have both consulting, process, policy, and technology in the same firm, which makes it more of a one-stop shop, makes it easier to solve the problem from our perspective. Uh, we're one of only two top-tier U.S. ServiceNow partners that we're aware of right now, uh, now that well, Fruition and Cloud Shippers are both in the big five. And that's, uh, it's been great for us. Uh, and has brought some new customers to us. Uh, we may have, we have well over, last point, over a decade of domain experience in each area of the ServiceNow portfolio, but we, we view all of this from a perspective that we call customer-centric IT service management. At Evergreen, we think traditional ITSM thinking is wrong because it puts the customer last. It's hard to believe, but true. In most cases, it takes a couple of years for us to even get around to thinking about the customer. It's kind of like the, uh, the board, that game you play, Where's Waldo? Two years ago, we really took notice of the beautiful self-service experiences we were having as consumers with Amazon and Apple and Google and Zappos, and we wondered why can our IPSM customers have the same thing? There wasn't an obvious answer that it couldn't be the case. So we started challenging our thinking on ITSM, and as a result, began looking at everything customer in rather than IT out. And that's essentially what created what we call customer-centric ITSM. If we start with the customer, we do things differently. We focus on preventing incidents rather than just handling them. We, we strive intently to use self-service and automation across ITSM to make customers happier and reduce the work of IT. Amazon's a wonderful example of that. You really can't talk to them, but it's the number one global retail experience. We see services as end-to-end -end team value chains rather than disconnected silos. And this better understanding leads naturally to better, smaller changes, kind of like DevOps, with less change failures because we know better. And knowledge can become you know, a powerful, beautiful self-service enablement experience that we can use to change the value of enabling technology for all of our customers. While well, most of our customers start here, this is the first time I've highlighted or I am highlighting our two-week strategy and roadmap engagement. We've delivered a couple of dozen of these now, so we get terrific reuse, which allows us to continually bring more value for the price. And this is a great place to start. Not only does it deliver a detailed three-phase strategy roadmap, we work with you and your team to help you create an initial working service taxonomy using our MindMap application which you get to keep. Normally, that's $7,500 on its own. We work through defining service ownership. 
from the perspectives of roles and responsibilities with an initial RACI map deliverable. We guide you through our service design process, working together to build several sample services with you and your team so you get the experience of doing it and the power of consistency, and you keep the process to build more. And we deliver all this in an executive briefing, along with a phase one statement of work for your use if you want to do it. Last but not least, we do create a working future state catalog and portal demo with your look and feel, and it's in a sandbox on the web, which you can use along with your roadmap to visually demonstrate what the future of customer-centric service might look like in your, in your organization. And all this is done in two weeks for 17.5. Enough of a commercial. So let's dive right in. As we often do, we want to go over a few idle definitions to get on the same page. There are four here today. The service is really simple. It's something someone will pay for that you do for them. Whether payment is time or money doesn't really matter. The, ser the customer still has to make an investment decision right, about that service. The service owner is the person who owns one or more services. Now, you could say that's easy. If I'm the person who provisions the database, then that is my service, and I control it. It's simple. Yeah, but what if it is just one element of delivering a complete computing capability in support of a critical application? Who owns that compound service? So the question of service ownership is a very interesting one. Customer-facing service is something the customer sees in the service catalog. What is interesting, when you look at the idle definition, is that there is also the other side of the coin as well, additional information needed by the service provider. So it really does address both parts. And the last one here is kind of a cool one, service culture. This is straight out of the idle V3 uh, definition set. Uh, but it sure looks like something you would do for outside customers, doesn't it? If I, ran an IT if I ran IT service management in a company, I would print this out and post it on my door. So it's almost essentially a mission statement if you think about it. So to be frank, what we're going to look at today is a lot harder role than we have been performing in IT. Given that first question to ask, is this optional or is it mandatory? Only you and your teammates can figure that out. And I highly recommend spending some time considering that question together and making a decision because this is a very different job. Here are three significant hard trends we think are real. CEOs are asking for Amazon-like employee experiences of IT, right, which is a beautiful, complete self-service experience. The DevOps revolution is coming. Continuous development is coming to all of us, or our company simply won't be competitive. Amazon makes over 400 changes a year to the world's largest data center annually. I would not want to compete with that. Last, IT is being asked by leadership to include the shared services parts of the organization in the Amazon-like customer experience. And CIOs want to take advantage of that. It's a great opportunity for IT. So the big question here is technology provider or strategic services partner? Innovative IT organizations are really beginning to understand that their value is delivering what the customer needs and wants in a high quality experience. But they don't actually have to provide the technology solution because the customer doesn't really care about that. They only care about the outcome, the functionality. This in turn is leading IT to focus on true services rather than technical outcomes, which is fueling the emergence of the role of the service owner. You can see that as a service owner, in order to do your job, you have a much larger number of questions you need answers to than you did in your job as a technical delivery manager. Truthfully, we aren't even thinking about many of these questions today. They arise when we start to see this service from the customer's eyes. Everyone has customers and everyone has services. I think we all have a pretty good idea of what a technical manager's role and daily activities are. And this is a good place to start since those still matter and are part of what a service owner needs to do. As I looked at this, it seemed that there were three additional primary roles, that of a product line manager, a service quality manager, and a team manager. We'll take a look at each of those and what sorts of daily activities they might want to perform. To give you the highest takeaway value from this webinar, I want to clearly establish the roles, the primary functions, and then give you some examples. 
My hope is that you can use this to fuel thinking about it in your own organization. The product line manager role is probably the most foreign role from IT's perspective, and I think it will be the most challenging to get a hold of. PLM is responsible for managing that entire product line life cycle from strategic planning to tactical activities from cradle to grave. The PLM must be able to competitively sell their service to their marketplace every day or they won't survive. The product or service will die. I focused on four core activity areas in this role. First, understand your customer. What do they want and need to be successful? What matters to them? Who are they? What are their lives like? And what are the challenges they face day in and day out? Second, closely aligned with that, understand your competition. And for IT, this often means understanding competitive alternatives. Now, this is something we don't like to do or think about very much. But guess what? The people who buy from us do it. Understand the alternatives. What do they cost? What do they offer? How do they compare? One cool idea here, remember, as a service broker, not just provider, you don't have to perform the activity, you only have to deliver the functionality. Maybe someone you previously saw as a competitor now is a possible provider to you. Third, identify potential future services or enhancements. Do this actively. Look for cool, innovative ideas outside your industry and adopt them. Henry Ford borrowed the assembly line idea from a meat packing plant right down to the Model T chassis moving down the line on hooks and chains. Last, put all of this into action, actively build and release new or enhanced functionality for your customers. The customer is really two kinds of personas, the end customer and the executive customer. We know the end customer wants a great experience. The executive customer wants that, but also wants to know cost, value, and what services are being used by their organization. The same is true for both the service owner and the service delivery executive. Seems to have frozen. Oh, there we go. Oh, went back one too much. Okay. Speaking of cost, most IT organizations that are pretty low maturity level when it comes to IT costing. This prevents IT from driving customer choice or participating in the fundamental conversation of business, which is a cost and benefit trade-off conversation. As we move into IT services, organizations are beginning to see this as mandatory rather than nice to have. Whether we actually get true cost reimbursement, that is the, you know, the cash changes hands, or just do showback costing, it still affects customer behavior. So, so creating better customer understanding and decision making is very powerful from an IT service costing standpoint. So here's some possible daily activities. I might spend an hour reviewing the end, the end of life phase for a service. How's that working? I might want to talk to a customer, maybe even do this every day since they're the center of our universe, or build or update a customer persona, you know, which is a consistent definition of who our customers are. Then maybe I'd spend a half an hour looking at a competitor's offering, what's new, what are they stressing, can it help me improve my service? Somebody else's innovation is a great place to get things. Later, I might talk to a peer service owner and see what she's innovating on, or how we might better deliver services together, or look outside my industry, like Amazon Marketplace, or Zappos, or at direct co company competitors. Last, I might check on progress of an innovative enhancement we're working on, or look for new ideas and feedback, incidents, problems, and suggestions. Maybe even have lunch with a level one or level two support person and see what they're working on. Now, obviously, you don't want to do all these things in any given day, but those are some ideas. The service quality manager role is probably the most familiar for us, but it's broader than what we've been thinking. The core focus here is delivering a consistent, high-quality, high-value service experience. We start with customer satisfaction as it is the highest value basis for service quality, almost like a capstone area. The customer cares about two things at the simplest level, delivering commitments on time, as promised, and a great service experience available, as promised. 
Service performance management helps support this to manage delivering our commitments and meeting established service availability goals. Ease of use and service completeness is about the customer service experience and something we don't often think about as the IT providers, but is just as important as the service performance management. Last alignment with business and strategy sounds like it fits in the PLM role, and maybe it does, but I put it here as a proactive peer of customer experience because it's a critical daily focus of service quality. For us to drive service quality proactively, we've got to align with what matters to the organization. Here's a quick look at some performance metrics alignment. These are valuable for all of the service owner's roles and can really help us as we move into this new world. And I actually use this chart in a number of the webinars because it, it shows the irrelevance in stacking. And KPIs cascade down in the pyramid from the customer, whoever that top person or, or organization is, to the owner, service owner, to the providers. And the KPIs become SLAs and SLAs become OLAs as we go down. And then the OLAs roll up into SLAs and the SLAs roll up into KPIs. So it actually kind of works both ways. Working as a team, we continuously seek to improve our service delivery as well as the measure of our success, helped by visible alignment with the customer. Here's some possible daily activities for this role. I might spend an hour looking at direct service feedback, read and reply to social media reviews, and look at all points of customer interaction for improvement opportunities, kind of fresh eyes. Next, I will look at my service performance metrics, analyzing trending and uncover anomalies, good or bad, in the data. I might talk to a specific team about their metrics, their ideas to improve, or help that they might need. Then I will definitely spend some time checking in on the customer service experience, perhaps focusing in on one of Evergreen's five service design principles for that experience. And we always focus on making it simple, beautiful, complete, predictive, and leading. And every point of the customer experience should reflect those principles. Last, perhaps, and this sounds crazy, Maybe I'll reread the CEO's strategy for the year and think about how it might affect my customers and then how I might best align against that, thereby improving service quality. Now we get to the team manager role. Every service we deliver is made up of lots of little services. And even though one person, let's say Betty, owns the big service here, there are lots of these little services being combined from different parts of IT to make up the big service. This is kind of scary because Betty knows she doesn't control those people. They don't work for her, so how can she possibly be successful? She begins to change the dialogue, explaining to everyone delivering services to her how important they are and how they fit into the big picture of what the customer really wants. Betty creates meaningful mission alignment because mechanically just doing a task is not emotionally very fulfilling but helping a customer as part of a team, that really is. And every day, Betty will work with everyone, giving feedback, helping them improve, streamlining, encouraging the effort, and making sure they see their part in the big picture. Now, it is a well-known fact, and it's pretty well established, individually as humans, if we understand our role in the big picture and the value, and the value chain from end to end, we will seek naturally to improve it. Everyone does, believe it or not. But without that visibility, it doesn't have relevance. The team manager role can seem like having responsibility without authority because in many ways, that's exactly what it is. But the truth is our world is a collaborative matrix place and we need to deliver services successfully to our customers given this reality. It begins with alignment of the customer, provider, and managers. All have needs that have to be met, and the service owner is ultimately responsible for helping them meet them and synchronizing them. Beginning by understanding and aligning with the customer allows providers and managers to understand the business needs and align more easily. Focusing on, I call these the big, the, the three C's, focusing on culture, coaching, and communication creates the critical team spirit that's necessary. Performance management gives us consistent measurable feedback, trending, and lessons learned to help align and improve our activities as a team. 
Continuous improvement is a proactive process with its own measurements, but rarely does it succeed without a healthy team spirit. Or let's say that it, it does much better with a healthy team spirit. There's some possible things I might do. I might discuss a specific customer persona or a set of problems with the team and get their thoughts on how we might do better. I might spend an hour communicating, highlighting a success or a valuable lesson learned, or maybe run a team building exercise with a team that is struggling. Then using the metrics, I might meet with a team to discuss trending or anomalies and what we can learn from them. Or I might ask for their help. What is their advice on a tough problem I'm dealing with? Or last, to improve work between adjacent teams, I might hold a brown bag lunch so each team can better understand what the other one does and what the other one cares about. Here's a quick look at the service owner workspace we've developed. On the left-hand side, well, that is the service owner workspace on the left-hand side, it includes information on customer satisfaction, quality, availability, delivery, those kind of things. I can easily see who my customers are and what they're currently asking me for. The idea behind this is to make it the one place where the service owner goes to reactively and proactively manage their service every day. It becomes their service owner's workspace, basically. Now, let's say I'm a service executive and I own many services. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of a dashboard I might use as an executive, showing at a glance the health and status of dozens of services organized by their type. If I see something that concerns me, I can then drill down into that specific service dashboard to see what's happening. So do we have to become service owners? If the answer is yes, I would say take heart. You know, we, we have a starting place. Teams naturally want to align with the customer. And there are best practices we can access for, we can access for activities that seem new to us. And it is a step-by-step -step journey, not a big bang activity. If you can, create a pilot service owner's workspace. The place where you go to manage your services is it will help you show the future of what a day in the life of an IT service manager could look like in your company. Of course, we're happy to help you with that. Well, that's it for our presentation today. I'll now turn it over to Jeff, where he will demo some of these concepts in action. Thank you, Don. Take over sharing here. All right. So uh, I, like Don, I'm going to start where I oftentimes start. <clears throat> I'm going to start with our kind of self-service portal from a customer or consumer perspective. And uh, so again, this is where uh, our customers would go to consume information about our services. They'd submit service requests as well as uh, ultimately track those service requests. Um, I also like to highlight that um, this is an opportunity or place where we can also push information to our users. We can broadcast alerts related health of service and outages. Um, we can also push prescriptive information to our consumers, things we want them to know uh, is going on within our organization. So one of the areas that <clears throat> we can go into on here is, uh, is kind of our service catalog. And this is you know, where I would go to get uh, a listing of our kind of published services, kind of learn about them either from kind of d digging in through from a taxonomy or from a service listings perspective. Um, but I can also go and see those that I'm, say, a subscriber of these various services. And again, some of the purpose for displaying this is to provide that kind of transparency to the consumer and clarify here's what they can expect, um, as well as kind of put these in, in a language that uh, aligns with their common you know, understanding of, of our services and service you know, information. Kind of our, our focus, so my focus today is going to be in our focus today on our presentation is kind of on the service owner. <clears throat> so one of the perspectives that we have out here is um, are the services that I own. Um, so this, in this case, kept it kind of simple. I have one service that I own, which is this Workday service. First of all, this is what a consumer would see about our service. This is what we call the service tombstone or service brochure page. And um, <clears throat> so there's information about what is the service, kind of what's in scope, what's out of scope. Um, in this case, we do have a couple different offerings that uh, we provide at different costs. 
um, and outlining some of those commitments and, um, and what you get for, say, a higher level of, of service, which has some additional features as well as a um, higher uh, uh, percentages in terms of availability and resolution and response time. There's also a tab uh, to communicate here's our current health of our service as well as how well it's done over the last uh, five days. And then we do take um, you know, qualitative feedback and information uh, from our consumers which they can provide here in this portal you know, as a way to rate and provide uh, feedback to drive that overall service improvement. Just to complete this page, <clears throat> um, at the top you'll also see uh, knowledge information that we've communicated is contextually relevant to this service to help uh, consumers uh, answer or self-solve some of the common questions, um, as well as opportunities to perform different types of service requests in context or a service, in this case, either become a new subscriber, request access to our, our service, or change your role and your rights within our uh, given service. As a service uh, owner, there are a couple different buttons I have <coughs> at my disposal that uh, my consumers would not have. One is the ability to edit my service. Um, another is a service dashboard that Don kind of showed a minute ago on slides. So let me dig into that. <coughs> so, you know, on the dashboard, you know, one of the first things I want to highlight is there's a service health section. And first of all, it's highlighting to me some of the active requests that are out there. One that's actually already breached um, that uh, I can't do much about, but I obviously want to make sure that I, I can get that resolved as quickly as possible. One that is approaching uh, or is, is, is moving in that direction of breach that uh, the elapsed time might be of concern to me and I might want to investigate further. I can also look at kind of the, the dependencies of my service and other different components, as well as their health over the last you know, five days. So these are the different uh, infrastructure components and other business services that my Workday service depends on. And I could also see this kind of from a map perspective, which is going to uh, show me more of a graphical representation of my dependencies between, say, a server down here and, um, and my overall business service that it, it supports. Bottom, this is probably the area that as a service owner I care the most about. So these are my commitments, um, which are grouped into some of my availability targets, my time to resolution targets, and delivery targets. And these have been summarized for me across my different offerings. Um, I can uh, kind of slice these and dig into in a little more detail. Maybe I really want to just hone in on my resolution target, kind of see how I've been trending along those lines. And I can see that I'm actually down from last month, about 15%. Um, and obviously we would want to, uh, at, at this point, I'm not meeting my target there uh, to my satisfaction. Some of the other things uh, I'll highlight here on this page, so there is a, um, obviously, recent feedback is important to me as a service owner, and, and notably negative feedback is important to me so I can consume and see that information here and interact with that. Um, I can also see who my active subscribers are. Right, and, um, and then the other thing I'll highlight up here, so this is some, these are some management information or some management options for me as a service owner. I can go look at my offerings. This is where I would define some of my different options. Right, here's where I define my different commitments um, and, and manage those elements there. I've got options here to change the linkage between my service and the different knowledge articles that I want to push and promote on that uh, tombstone view. So I can manage that here. And I can also manage my, um, what requests I want to show as requestable in context in my service in this page as well. And this is a case where there's really two different ways that, that this can be configured. Um, in this case, this is being configured more from a dynamic filter perspective in that it's going to show any uh, requestable catalog item that has a keyword of Workday and is in a category of services. The other way that I could manage this would be more of a managed list of saying these are the specific items that um, are requestable for this particular application or this particular service. All right, so let's dig in a little further. So this is where I would go to actually make edits to my service definitions. A couple things you'll see here. Um, one, I can change where I want to organize this from a classification or taxonomy perspective. Obviously, I can name it, I can change my descriptions and other information I want to highlight to my consumers. But there's information here about how my service relates and depends on other configuration items. This is obviously where I could edit some of those service dependencies and relationships. And then my scope information, you'll see that down below. 
And then the other thing I want to hit on is <clears throat> there's some options here. So I have a dependency on different configuration components, components, but I can also manage kind of how these related configuration components impact my service in the, uh, in the event of a change, in the event of a, uh, an outage, or in the event of, of, a, of a high priority incident. So what this is, this is basically a rules page where I can say, for one, I can turn off all kind of dependency spreading. So maybe I don't want my Workday service to be impacted by that of its other dependent components. Um, the other thing I can do in here is I can actually group some items together. So maybe I want to say, I'll just call this app cluster. So what I would be saying in this situation is that both of these components are kind of acting as one, so that if they're both down, then my service is impacted. If one of them is down, they're redundant and it has no impact. Further, I can specifically exclude certain components from having any dependency on my service. All right, so with that kind of set up, <clears throat> let me create an outage and kind of show you kind of how this uh, works. So I can create a new, I'll just put myself as the caller of an incident. I will put in a component. So if you remember from my map, this was a server that was in my dependency tree. And I can say something like server is currently unresponsive. I'll just hop highlight that. And then from my menu bar, I can create an outage from here. I could put a different message for my audit, but I'm just going to duplicate the same message I have here. And I'm going to say begin outage now. So now the interesting thing with that is I created one outage in context of this incident, but you'll see it actually created six different outage records in ServiceNow. And the reason for that is it actually took this one outage here for the server, found all the related components, and used that definition mapping table to drive um, kind of a service impact outage. And so just to highlight this further, I could also change this to say this happened at to say this happened at 9 a.m. this morning instead. And if I refresh this screen, you'll notice that all of these are synchronized uh, amongst the same outage records because they're all basically treated as one, but they're spread across the different components that um, are impacted. So as a service owner, if I refresh say my dashboard page, now that I have an outage record out there, so see a couple things that I'm highlighted on here. One is one of my requests that actually just kind of moved over a 50% range, so I'm getting some uh, alert for that. Um, I'm also being notified that my, work, my actual service is in a degraded uh, stage. I'll just kind of minimize that for the moment. But I can also see now that I have an active outage for my Workday service. If I expand this, I see, well, this is an outage for this component as well as my identity management service and my component. And I do see it's also highlighting this is the source of my outage. Now, one of the things I can do here as well is I can annotate this outage record uh, for my consumers and provide some additional information. You know, maybe I want to just say, don't, don't jump off the bridge just yet. We have this under control. Right, kind of use that as a communication vehicle to my consumers. So just to complete this uh, kind of picture, let me take this uh, incident. Let's resolve it. And I'll just put in some bogus information. Okay, permanent test. Resolve that incident. So now when I close the incident, taking a moment as it computes our outages. So now, let me go back to the incident. So now you'll see our outages are now beginning and end and an overall outage impact of two hours and 34 minutes. On my dashboard, my outage should now be cleared. If I refresh this, it is, I do get a notice that it's um, been restored. And my actual availability target numbers would be slightly adjusted based off of that, uh, that outage impacting my actual service. So the other one I want to hit on, so that's kind of the uh, availability target and kind of communication of outage health um, or service availability health to our consumers. The other one I want to show is, is the service request. So if I request, say, a <clears throat> access to the service, I'm going to order that now. So there's my new request. So as a consumer, I can kind of see where it's at. 
can dig into the details a little bit to see kind of how it's progressing. Right? I'm also kind of seeing when is it actually due and when can I expect this thing to be completed. Um, if I go back to the dashboard, oops, let me go back there here. Dashboard. There's really no change to my dashboard at this point. I minimize this. Um, because my actual my actual request is not yet in any alarm kind of state, right? Um, but if I let's say I go to my request record, and this is my new one that I submitted right here. There's a couple things I want to highlight on this. One is you'll see it first of all the configuration item is set to one of our offerings. And the reason it's set to this is I'm actually already set up as a subscriber of a specific offering. Uh, so it's using that as my um, uh, kind of my selection. If I wasn't already a subscriber, I would have been prompted for what offering do you want to have access to. Um, but in this case, it's already setting me up with that. And then the other thing you'll notice is because it's tied to one of our offerings that has a delivery expectation or a commitment, um, this SLA has been started for this particular request. And this has a one business day expectation. Uh, and that's right, as of right now, we're still at a 0%. But if I were to say change this percentage to started this at 8 a.m., right, and I were to refresh this, you'll see that's now at 33%. Right, if I move this to say yesterday at, I'll just say 3 o'clock, refresh that, you'll see I'm at 55%. So now it should be in a situation if I played it correctly from numbers perspective, it should be something that's now highlighting itself on my page as it is. You'll see it's at 55% now and it's something that I would want to dig deeper into to see what is going on with this request is something I can do to um, kind of speed it along. Right? And I can dig into where is it at in its progress. I can dig into further details of its actual request workflow and where it's at. And, um, and try to remediate and solve this particular uh, request to make sure it gets done within my, my time frame. All right, so shifting gears, one last thing I want to kind of hit on that kind of fits into the um, day in life activity of, say, a, a service owner is um, kind of the managing of risk of change records um, or of change in, in, in to your service. So kind of taking that same <clears throat> kind of scenario we had before of a, of a outage record and its impact, I could also plan a change record against, say, that same server right, um, that we had created an outage from before. And this could be, say, an OS patch to be applied for security reasons. And just to fill out this change, I'll put in a couple other placeholders. And I want to schedule this for Friday, and I'm going to schedule this after hours at 11 p.m., and I'm going to wrap this around to Saturday morning, say 1 a.m. Seems like a good time to make a change. So I save that. <clears throat> and the first thing I want to, you know, of course the first thing I'll highlight on here is, one, is it's identifying to me that this actual change does impact some of my services. And again, this is from that seem to be relationship map. Um, we know about a Workday service, but there's also a Salesforce.com service that also is leveraged by this identity management service. So it's highlighted here as an impact as well. The other thing is you'll see up here, conflicts are detected. If I go to the conflicts section, I'll see that oh, this is actually conflicting with a maintenance window that we have for our Salesforce.com service. So I can dig into this and see that we have an agreement that our, we're only going to make changes to our Salesforce.com service between 1 and 4 a.m. on Saturday. So I'm kind of, I'm actually not directly impact, or not directly um, making a change to our Salesforce.com service, but I'm making a change to something that actually does impact that, that service since it depends on the server and, the, and depends on the service that this server supports. So if I have flexibility, you know, we could actually proceed with this change and get approval and authorization to do something that would actually conflict with that schedule. But if I have flexibility in my timing, you know, obviously I'd want to try to move this to, to match or fall within that window. So maybe I'll just move this to between 2 and 4 p.m. or 4 a.m. Save that. You'll notice now it says no conflict. My conflicts have been remediated. Right, so I've kind of aligned with that schedule. 
So the next, uh, just to kind of move this along um, on the chain, this is a rather involved workflow, but um, basically the process here is, uh, I'll give this an assignment group, so somebody to actually work this change. And the first place it goes is when I say request approval, it actually seeks technical approval first from the members of the hardware group. So somebody from that group can come in here and um, approve this particular change. And then the thing I want to highlight from here is that the next phase or the next step within the approvals is this change advisory board as well as any of our impacted service owners. So here's another case where our service owners have a role in this change in that because these three services here are impacted, right, if you look at um, salesforce.com again as an example, Mara Reinhardt is the um, service owner. Well, if you look down here, we'll see Mara is actually listed as an approver of this particular change, and she's not part of this CAV approval group. So each of these service owners, Mara, myself, and Jacqueline, would all have to approve this change to authorize that this is actually um, okay in terms of the impact to their particular respective services. <clears throat> Last thing I want to highlight on here is, um, you know, I kind of started my demo with a uh, kind of the customer's perspective of these services. Well, the customer also has a view into some of these planned impacts to their, uh, the services they're a consumer of. And those can be found on this um, kind of service uh, status page, which gives me some details around the active alerts and outages, um, but also gives me a section where I can see what are the upcoming planned maintenances for our um, given different services. So here's a case where we're communicating that um, this particular workday service, identity management service, and Salesforce comp, comp service all have some upcoming plan maintenance this Saturday between 2 and 4, so I'm alerted to those activities. So that covers what I, uh, what I hope to show today. Um, I thank you for your time, and I, I do hope this was helpful in kind of seeing how ServiceNow can support kind of that day in the life of a of service owner, um, also providing some visibility to the health of their service as well as kind of delivering the service um, to agreed commitments and, uh, and also lastly providing a vehicle that can engage with your service consumers. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. One second. There you go. So uh, if you found that interesting, here's some possible next steps. Uh, if you're interested in the advanced self-service catalog and portable, portable, portal capability, the portable portal capability that Jeff demonstrated, <laughs> Uh, it's available as a fully functioning self-service demo. You can, uh, you can hit it on our website. It's fun. It's easy to use. It's very intuitive. And over 700 people have signed up to demo it. Uh, you can sign up and be using it in five minutes. Uh, perhaps another thing, if you're, if you're considering a broader service catalog initiative and aren't sure where to start, we do have a one-day workshop on site for up to 15 people for $39.50, which includes travel. And it's a great way to get everyone on the same team to educate your team to a consistent level, creating common language, direction, and it can literally save months of effort in consensus building and communication. If you would like a copy of one of our consulting guides, these things that we actually build during our, during our work and publish, our services definition dictionary is one, service taxonomy guide, services governance guide, just reply via email and we'll be in touch to get it to you. Uh, last, of course, you, perhaps you're interested in, you know, establishing kind of a clear service catalog direction and roadmap, and maybe take a deeper, you know, you might want to then take a deeper look at our two-week offering. So that's all we've got to cover today. Let's, uh, let's open it up if we have any questions, Steph. Uh, we do have a few questions. First of all, for any request, probably the easiest email is to email me, and if you just email marketing at evergreensys, that's S-Y-S, so marketing at evergreensys.com for any of those requests, I will get you connected with the right people. Uh, on the questions, Don, I'm going to start with one that came in for you. It says, Don, you mentioned that having cost information is important for, important for affecting consumer choice. What other levers does IT have for affecting customer choice? Yay, I got a question. <laughs> Since I'm not the technical guy, <laughs> you never I don't know. usually get many questions. So, uh, great, thank you. <laughs> uh, suggested cost, I did mention that, is a powerful lever as, as well as real cost. Another, another uh, tool or great lever is the uh, 
good, clear descriptors of what the service is and who is intended for, and that can help the customers to choose correctly. For example, you know, for an application, if it's properly described for its purpose and the intended target, then they don't necessarily buy the pro version if they only need a viewer. And people will select what's really sort of designated for their kind of need. So that can help very much. Beyond that, uh, you know, we really want to have a focus on steering customers away from everything being custom. Right? If IT is going to benefit from this kind of self-service employee interaction, we really need to steer people towards three or four primary offers that we want them to select most of the time, you know, which we kind of call those happy meals. Right? And if we, if we want to make that happen and affect consumer behavior, both cost and delivery time are very powerful levers. Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, Jeff, I've got a couple for you. So let's see. Uh, would the service owner be notified outside of the portal if they were nearing a breach for one of their commitments? Yeah, I would say they should. Um, you know, I would say w within ServiceNow, any of the commitments that um, I kind of showed today that can be they can be linked to uh, what's called an SLA record, um, which in turn can be linked to what's uh, called a, a, a an SLA workflow or proactive kind of management workflow. And um, within that workflow, you can configure any number of rules uh, that would fire, say, at an appropriate as it approaches a target. So, like say, for example. Let's say 75% of our target to complete <clears throat> a service request, um, we could generate notifications to the service owner, but we could also, if we wanted to, send messages to the requester. We could manipulate the, the task. We could change some of the assignments on the task or perform some other actions to try and get, say, that request completed within those agreed to uh, kind of time frames. Great, thanks. Another one, Jeff. How does a subscriber to a service get established? Good question. So I kind of uh, glossed over a little bit. So I had the My Services part of the portal, um, and, and that this can be done in a couple different ways. But um, I'd say the one that's most, one of the more predominant ways is, is kind of a more pr is to predefine and kind of the setup of the service. Um, you would say, you know, this is a service that is provided to this company, department, this group, um, and basically through the inheritance of what companies the service is provided to or the departments are provided to, um, it would pull in what are the actual subscribers who are, you know, in, a, in essence, a member of either that company, department, or group. Uh, but another way that can be accomplished uh, would be, say, within a workflow. So say like an example of that new access request in the workflow after it's been fulfilled, I could be made as a subscriber to the, the service offering um, you know, once I've been granted access. And then I'd say probably the last uh, option that's out there is, uh, you know, could come from, I guess the subscriber list could come from an integration from another repository. You know, take Workday as an example in the demo. Um, that could come from an active feed of active users from Workday, for example. Great. And let's see, uh, I've got one more question. So if you all have any questions, feel free to send them in. And uh, Jeff, this one's for you. What other types of commitments would be set up on the service within ServiceNow beyond availability, response, and resolution time? So, I mean, the, uh, the list can be somewhat infinite um, in terms of what the commitment definitions are. It's basically a table that you can add to, create your own listings. Um, <clears throat> so some of the you know, commitments you set on a service may be what I would consider more of an attribute. Uh, that you'd use to communicate to your consumers um, but don't actually have any active measurement behind them. Um, so like for example, in my service today I had some, some attributes that were, uh, we provide uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, enhanced support or uh, multi-language support or we provide kind of virus protection. Um, I'd say it also makes sense to make commitments. You could have commitments around the, the quality of the service, um, some of those, and those could be measured by those feedback and ratings uh, to, to to meet a given fee, you know, quality of service target. Great. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so unless Don has anything to add, I think I will go ahead and wrap it up for a day. So you all will receive an email no later than tomorrow with a link to both the recording and the slides. Also, I encourage you to visit the resources page at evergreensys.com where we have copies of all our past webinars as well as where we announce our upcoming events. So thank you, and we will see you soon.